Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Proust. This is Jeffrey Reddick. This is Dexter from this The Offspring. Nathan East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is David Lapp. This is Stuart Cope. This is Mick Gillette. I'm Krista Verna. This is Ryan Sick. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, I'm Mark Valley. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> this is Jordan Harbinger, and you're listening to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero, Mark Valley, and Pete A. Turner. Jordan Harbinger. <laughs> Jordan Harbinger grew up in Royal Oak, Michigan, went to the University of Michigan, go blue, where he earned his undergrad and JD, spent some time as a Wall Street lawyer, but is perhaps best known for having been a podcaster for, get this, 11 years. Get out of here. He's hosted over 900 episodes featuring guests like Shaq, Tony Hawk, Gary Vaynerchuk, Tim Ferriss, and of course our friend Jay Moore. His new show is called The Jordan Harbinger Show. I know. It's really creative. I'm really good with naming things, you know? Yeah. Really creatively titled the new show. Nailed it. And it's he, pretty sticky. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's sticky. How could you forget it. that? The uh, Jordan Harbinger Show. That's right. So, welcome, man. We're elated to have you. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate you guys coming all the way out. Well, here's a funny side note. Uh, my cousin Dan lives not far away from here, and... Uh, if you walk into his house, he's, of course, going to offer you a beverage, and he's going to hand it to you in an Ohio State glass. So <sighs> yeah, That's in case him, you drop it. Then he's <laughs> like, oh, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> right. It's just an Ohio State glass. <laughs> hey, so uh, I want to ask a, a Michigan versus Ohio State question first, sure. just to jump in. The world, the nation, the football people – are crazy for Notre Dame and Ohio State. Yeah. How high would you say the average overranking of them is? Oh, I don't know. I care so little about football that when I work when I went to school there for seven years at Michigan, yeah. I sold my tickets every single year <laughs> at a profit. <laughs> and I think I went to like three games. This is not your thing at all. I just don't care. Yeah. yeah, I just don't care. And I always thought it was really and pardon me if this hits too close to home, I always thought it was so sad in some ways to see all these grown men who are like 50 go oh yeah no, such such and such name because I'm like that's an idiot in my math class who can't do any of the work <laughs> and you're like <laughs> you like you look up to this kid he is going to be lucky to be a functioning person after he leaves this school well it's a good thing for at least 40 of the people you describe that they're job and the talent that's landed them in such an esteemed location is to just be big and in the way. Yeah. And so some people have a, a natural gift. And for some of those guys, they get like the 50 year old guys like, you really, you want to work at my construction company? And they're like, yes, you know, this yeah. named guys here. So they all get taken care of, I guess, in some way. Yeah. I just, I remember thinking, because some some of those guys were really nice, and that was great, but some of them were really not. And I remember thinking, yeah, you're such a big shot. Let's talk in 10 years when you're loading shit into my car at Home Depot, <laughs> and I'm going to be nice to you, yeah. and I'm going to go, I remember you. Yeah. You used to cut in line at the dining hall. Well, how's life? <laughs> right. Oh, you missed one. You know, like... Uh. You Everybody to, gets their privilege at some point in yeah. their lives. Some people peak early. That's the one thing that gives me a little bit of compassion is... It can't be easy to be that young and have all that attention put on you yeah. because you don't really think, well, this is temporary. Yeah. You think, oh, this is, I am better than everyone. This is going to last forever. And then when that's not true anymore, it actually must hurt a lot more than somebody who gets out of college and goes, man, I'm so lucky I graduated. Now I have to find a job. This is going to be hard. It must really be really harder for somebody who's had it all handed to them. They work hard in the athletics, but then if they don't make it to the next rung up, which is 99% of those guys, they have to go and apply for a job. And they're probably woefully underqualified because they show up to the interview and go, well, you know, I played football for Michigan. So yeah. when do I start? <laughs> right. You yes. know? Yeah. Woefully underqualified and, and definitely underprepared. Yeah. Because they don't even know how to take what's coming at them. No. So... Your gift to the rest of us, I suppose, is your natural curiosity as a social scientist. And scientist in air quotes. Really, you just put it into context for everybody who is listening, who has yet to hear your work. And if you have yet to hear Jordan's work, podcast one, The Jordan Harbinger Show. And we're going to repeat that a few times so you go to it. But 
really as a social scientist in air quotes, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you d- deserve the air quotes. Uh, I would I'll take them out, and I would say that you're doing it. You've done a thousand shows. You know how to talk. That's mm-hmm. not a problem. But what's going to be unique? Because we're not going to ask you like, "What's it like?" You know, yeah, like nonsense. But when you have sat I guess in front I better of, better delete that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you've had 500 hour long conversations with people who do these things, you've spent more time in the field than social scientists have. You know, you've you've done the work. Yeah, I'm not testing individual variables, and I don't have a scientific method. So that's kind of what I wanted to clarify. Because I think there's someone who goes, I'm a brain scientist. It's like, well, you take a lot of vitamins. (laughs) This other person is a brain scientist. They have an MRI machine and they have 7,000 people sitting in it looking at pictures of brown shoe, alarm clock, brown shoe, alarm. Like that's a scientist. And and so I want to be really clear because on the Jordan Harbinger show, I'm very clear to delineate what is pseudoscience and anecdote versus what is actual science. So the show's not necessarily about hardcore science. We have plenty of episodes with that. But I also, I'm very cognizant of what creates results. So in that way, yes, I'm looking at the science. But in other ways, it's more important because it's about the results. I just don't want people to go, this isn't science because you didn't run a control and blah, 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 blah. And I respect that because I think it's really easy now to say, well, I have different science and my science says that I'm right. It's like, well, no. That's not actual science. That's not real science. That's called opinion. Right. The science that shows that your vitamin supplement is more effective than exercise is not science. It's a claim. And so I want to, like what we're teaching on the Jordan Harbinger show is how do you evaluate these claims How do you evaluate any information coming from any source and think critically through it so that you can make the right decision? Because I think right now, especially, there's a lot of untruth and a lot of it is couched in, well, you know, we ran our own experiments and in our experiments in our lab. And it's like, you don't have a lab. You write eBooks. It's not a laboratory. (laughs) Right. right. You know, it's not a real one. It's on one channel. Yeah. And the whole repeatable, externally repeatable requirement, that scientific method thing. Yeah. You know, can someone else replicate your results in their actual lab? And then you start to have the ability to say those things. And that whole academic scientific process, it takes for fucking ever. Yeah. And it's one piece, one strand. Like we had uh, Dexter Holland on from The Offspring. He's got a PhD. And he's the first one as an actual, air quote, real scientist. He'll say, I just think I might have figured out one piece maybe of the puzzle possibly. Mm -hmm. I am not with those guys in terms of being a peer. This is just some work that I was passionate about and I pushed hard enough to get this PhD. Like That's how much he backs off and he's got a PhD in molecular biology. Right. And that's what somebody who really knows what they're doing will do. They'll go, I know a tiny part of this and that's what my PhD was in. Whereas somehow somebody who decided to study brain waves or meditation or, oh, I'm studying theta brain waves. Okay, that's great. Doesn't make you a scientist. Those people will say, I have the solution. It's like, well, how did you go from not knowing anything about this two years ago to reading, quote unquote, the science and then inventing a machine that, let's say, replaces meditation or replaces the need for proper this and that and the other thing, whereas multiple teams of doctors and PhDs in pharmaceutical laboratories, hospitals, and research centers around the world have yet to even come close to this. How is that possible? And the answer is, well, one person is able to just sort of make claims in order to make money, and the other side has to actually test things and get it approved by the FDA and other places like that. So I'm not saying the FDA is the arbiter of all things true and holy when it comes to even medicine, but I am saying that there's so many people out there that are making ridiculous claims that it pays to figure out where their incentives lie. And so that's why I I will say I'm a social scientist in the way that it's sort of tongue in cheek. Yes, I'm a social scientist and that I'll run experiments and I'll get results for myself and for people that I'm teaching. Is it science? No. Is it going to be repeatable by everybody? Yeah, in theory, but that doesn't make it science either. It just makes it a reliable technique. Totally different from science. Are you publishing it? On the Jordan Harbinger show, sure. But is it in a journal? No. No, If I wrote an article, would it hold up in the journal? No. Was there a control? No. Unless we're talking about me before trying this, me after trying this. That's not a reliable control. So a real scientist would go, 
hey, I like what you're doing, but it's not science. And I would go, I agree. Let's start over. Jordan Harbinger yes. is a student of that, social capital. There you go. And <laughs> he's very respectful of science. Mm. So as a student of social capital and of ways that people navigate society, the large society and the smaller societies, what you're bringing on the Jordan Harbinger show is really amusing, insightful, and practical ways that we can hopefully learn something that help us to get through a part of our lives a little easier. Sure. Or at least a little more studiously and a little more uh, maybe aware. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, look, what we're teaching on the show, we have worksheets for every episode. So it's like, if we're teaching you how to network and generate relationships, there's going to be a worksheet that goes along with it that gets you applying this stuff. Every episode solves a problem and makes the listener better in some way. Because a lot of shows just go, let's discuss something. And at the end, you're like, oh, I killed my drive time. That was good. But I think the bar has to be higher now. Because there's so many podcasts. There's like 350,000 or something, right? There's a new podcast out every five seconds. So why should anyone listen to me versus listening to somebody else? Well, since I'm a millennial, I should say, but I'm special. But the real answer is they shouldn't. There has to be more value in it. So I want to bring the value there. I want to make it practical. I want to have great guests. I want to out-prepare other hosts. That's why I spend like 10 or 12 hours preparing for each guest. And I'm not just going to wing any conversation at all. And I think that that's really important because I think now it's really easy to create content and just like throw it at the wall and some of it's going to stick and some of it won't. And that's why when I left Art of Charm, my old podcast, I was like, well, I'm, I'm losing so much. And I realized actually not really. There's 900 episodes of that, but the first 700 are kind of like, would I even listen to that again? Hell no. So if I have to start over, then great, fine. Because the work that I'm doing now is a million times better than the work I did a year ago. And that is important in this space and in any space, because if you're not giving people something that's your best, it's kind of just like a waste of everyone's time. Why did you create it if it's not your best? Well, that was a waste. Why am I subjecting other people to it? Well, because I need clicks. I mean, that sucks, right? So especially in the podcast and the internet space, you just have to make better stuff. And the way that you do that is by, in my opinion, by outworking everyone. Because yeah, you can have talent or something, but most of us don't. Most of us just have to work hard. So... The process to get to 900, where you know what you're going to do, though, it takes 900 shows to get there. It does, there. yeah. At least it does for you. And yeah, maybe some of those takes 1,000. Maybe it's a, you know, it's a different number. So when you see what's next for you, you, you do get to move on, whether it's within your old show or in a new show or whatever. Yeah. That doesn't devalidate what happened on episode 622, you know, when you talk to, you know, whoever. Sure, yeah. But what do you bring along from those things? Like the, the lessons that all these incredible people you've talked to, what sticks, with, what shapes what, who you are? Because you're clearly not the same person. No one is 10 years later, but you've had this incredible experience. I mean, if it's 500 episodes of hour long, you know, plus your mailing things, you've taught yourself more than you ever learned at Michigan. Yeah, sure. You've had some pretty remarkable input. Well, thanks. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, if I may piggyback on Pete's question, I think what we're after here is uh, absolutely people should understand your body of work and maybe, not, I was going to say, go back through and listen to all of them, but maybe There's the seven. most recent yeah. 200. The, uh, there are seven now in the new show. It's going to be really easy to catch up. But the effect on you personally, what have you felt and what have you walked away from 900 episodes going, yeah, I'm a different guy now. Mm, yeah. So I learned a lot over interviewing. Oh man, I don't even know. I should probably count the interviews because there's 900 episodes. They're not all interviews. Right. But I would say over the 600 plus interviews that everyone has, oh man, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that I've learned. What have I really learned? The fact is everyone goes through the same type of learning process. Hmm. The differentiating factor that I found is not that most people or not that some people are more talented than others. It's that a lot of people get obsessed with something and then they get really good at it. So when I'm talking with somebody like Shaq, yeah, he's got basketball talent, but he really worked really hard and still works really hard and still puts in a lot of effort and time and he's working on different. Th now he's not working on jump shots. You know, he's working on DJing, yeah. or, DJing, or, yeah, yeah. He, he knows what the work feels like, mm -hmm. and so he's going to apply that ethic to whatever it is he does. It's yeah. the only thing he knows. And I found that every guest that's been really good has worked on that. Now, scientists, they get obsessed with a topic they go through, they get a PhD, they write a book. But a star athlete or somebody like Russell Brand, 
who went through an addiction, he's thought strongly about this and he's put his thoughts to paper. And that's what I've really learned is the only really big difference between me and somebody who is a world famous A-list celebrity is there's an element of luck in it pretty much anybody who's successful or, or unsuccessful for that matter. But it's a very tiny piece. So we'll just dispense with that because there's always that. The rest of it is they just kept working when other people didn't. And when they hit setbacks, they just went, okay, well, this is normal. They didn't give up. And the message is not never give up. The message is you have to follow what you want to do and continue doing it in the face of adversity. And that sounds really simple. But the truth is most people won't do that. Most people will go, this is so great when they're good at it. And then they'll hit a wall and they'll go, I give up now. Life is unfair. And I know that people listening think I don't do that. But really, you kind of do. It just depends on how much everything is smacking you in the face. And I thought that when I had to start over my show over, start the Jordan Harbinger show over from the ashes of the art of charm, I thought I can't do this again. But after going through this sort of mourning period of like whining about it, now I realize I can not only can I do it again, it's going to be faster, it'll be easier, and it'll be better than before. And it's not just a pep talk. I look back at 900 episodes, like I said, the first 700, I could just never hear again, that would be fine. And even the last few, I look at anything that wasn't created in 2017, it's now 2018, and I just think, ugh, you know? So it's a constantly improving process. It's fine to lose some of the dead weight. And I notice that people who create things and are really good at it, they don't look at their old stuff and think, I'm so good at this. They're always being self-critical. They're always looking at how they can improve. They're surrounding themselves with people that teach them how to improve and don't just tell them how great they are. When I interviewed Shaq, he had a manager who was like, hey, you should do more of this. He had what he called the panel. In the panel was a group of people around him that didn't tell him lies to make him feel better. It was like his accountant, his lawyer, his manager, his mom, his uncle, and I think a friend or a coach. And he would convene these people. I don't know if it's a virtual thing or in real life or or whatever, phone calls. He would convene these people and say, should I do the insurance commercial? And of course, his accountant's like, yeah. Pays a lot of money. (laughs) Yes. And the lawyer would go, yeah, we just need to make sure that we kind of don't have you making claims in the commercial that look bad for your brand. And then his mom would go, ooh, this looks really fun. You'll have fun with that. And then his manager would go, yeah, this is great, and it's not going to interfere with any of your other projects. And then one of his friends would go, I don't know, man. This looks really stupid, man. You know, like you, you have this other thing. You could do the ice cream thing. I don't know what the money's like, but this one looks really more, much more interesting. So everyone has these different opinions, and it's great because in a position that you – if you're Shaq or in a, another position similar to him for any reason, like maybe you're just a re- wealthy person or you're a famous person or you're, you're the CEO of a company or you have a family, there's always going to be people who have an agenda. So, of course, if you get a commercial offer, whoever's getting a cut, your agent's going to be like, yes, let's do this. But if your mom goes, this makes you look like an idiot, she doesn't care about the money. She doesn't, she's not getting a cut. She right. doesn't get a commission. And you need that balanced advice. And I think that that's really useful. That's something I took away from that episode specifically, but that I've implemented in my own life, which is if I get excited about something and I tell my wife and she's not excited about it, okay, well, that's a problem. Or if she's excited about it, but my producer's not excited about it, or my parents aren't excited about it, you have to have that panel. And- That was really useful for me because there's a lot of things that I got excited about or that even with the split from the old company and starting the new show, there's a lot of people that are like, hey, this, you know, you should have. And looking back, my panel was like, get rid of these guys, you know, do your own thing. And I thought, oh, no, it's going to be too hard. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. Had I really had the panel together years ago, I probably would have avoided a lot of the pain in the butt that I'm facing right now because a lot of people around me went, oh, yeah, you should have gotten out of there a long time ago. I always thought those guys were schmoes. And I'm like, well, shit, yeah, nobody why told didn't you me. Say something three years ago? And right. the reason is because I didn't freaking ask, and I wouldn't have listened anyway, and I think they probably knew that. But if you have the panel and they know that they're not going to get kicked off the panel for telling you like it is, you can get real honest information. And that's really important. Most of us don't have that. Wow. That is really, really powerful. Yeah. We can hit the stop button right now. There we go. (laughs) See you guys later. Yeah. The idea of having people around you who actually 
will say these things and will be blunt with you and will be candid and don't have an agenda seems obvious. It seems obvious, but it has to be formalized. Yeah. How many of us actually do it? And not certainly in a formal setting. I mean, I go to my dad for advice all the time, but a lot of times we're just bullshitting. Anyway. Yeah, of course. So I, yeah. the thing about that is that you have people who know you, who know your traits, know how you've reacted to things in your past if they've been with you for a while. And a lot of times you're unable to see those things for yourself, you know, standing in the forest and unable to see the trees. But if you're going to surround yourself with a panel like that, you really think the formalization is the key? It's important because otherwise, if you just say, hey, I got this great idea. What do you think? And they go, if there's no sort of look, I really need your opinion. This is what other people think. Then they'll just go, oh, yeah, well, Jordan's excited about this. So, okay. And your wife will do that, your best friend will do that, your kids will do that, your producer, whatever, whoever you have on your panel will do that because they don't know if you're asking them for honest advice or not. Yeah. But if you have a panel and you go, all right, let's evaluate this opportunity, then people go, I don't like it and here's why. They're not thinking, oh, crap, I'm going to hurt Jordan's feelings if I say this. They're thinking, I don't care. This is not a part of the equation. The reason I'm being asked this is because I have my opinion and he values it. It has nothing to do with me making him feel bad. You want people on the panel who are going to go, this is crap and here's why. Yeah. You don't want people on the panel who are going to go, oh, if I say something he doesn't like, he's not going to ask me again and then I'm not going to get a free flight to San Diego or whatever. <laughs> you don't want that. That's why you have to be around people who are willing to just say, this is the dumbest idea I've ever heard, even though everyone else in the room might like it. And that's the value of the panel. So if it's not formal, people might just not be in the mood to fight with you about it. They might not be in the mood to give you honest feedback. They might not even look at it in depth. They might just go, oh, yeah, you're writing a book? Oh, yeah, cool, man. Congratulations. They're not going to go, you're writing a book now? Wait, who's publishing it? You're self-publishing it. Don't do that. No, 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 no. Get a traditional publisher, then you can hit the New York Times list, but you're not in a position to do that right now. You've got to rebuild your platform. You're in a place that where you know, you're going to get a deal. It's going to be lower than the value than you can bring in six months where you can show them better numbers. Your friends are just going to go, oh, great, yeah, great, cool. Uh, are you hungry? That's not what we're looking for with the panel, right? We're looking for this is a terrible idea and here's why. And you want people who are qualified to tell you that, not just... Well, I have six roommates. They're my panel now. No. They have to be people who are invested in your success. It's got to be like your significant other, you know, like Shaq has. It's like his mom, his uncle, his coach, his manager, his lawyer. Those people are invested in his success. They're not just close to him. They're not just friends. Because your friends don't know if you just need emotional support or if you need somebody to tell you that this is stupid. Yeah, your friends at best want to give you emotional support. Right. Shaq doesn't have his baby cousin, Ray Ray, who says, yeah, mm -hmm. Shaq, you sure got big feet, man. Yeah. You know, and that's, <laughs> that's why Pete and I can't be on each other's board. Because we'll be like, yeah, that's a great idea, Pete. Yeah. Is there a wing stop near there? Yeah. yeah. Let's go there. I will yeah. jump off any cliff. John's like, hey, you want to jump off this cliff? Oh, you already did it. All right. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm cool. jumping off too. Exactly. Yeah. When I worked in Iraq, a lot of the time, you're talking to commanders. They have a, a board, a panel, but they have command authority over these people. So my intent is to create stability. And everybody grabs their pen and they write down, to create stability. Mm -hmm. My job, I was ended up being kind of like this auxiliary panel member because I would go out and I'd say, all right, you're creating schools. You're trying to get f ed females educated. You're trying to build trust in the government. So I'd go out and I'd talk to the people in town like, where do your kids go to school? And I'm like, oh, they go over there. And they point to the American school. I'm like, all right, let's ask some detailed questions now. And they're like, all right, listen, all right, that's going to be too hard. My kids don't go to that school. It's too dangerous. They'll get killed. I won't send them there. We send them there when the Army asks us to. And then after that, we bring them back. So I take that news back to the commander. And I'm like, if you're trying to establish education, we've got work to do. And it's not building a school. It's in developing trust mm -hmm. or confidence in the security that's there these kind of panel people sometimes are outside of your you know it's not your cousin ray ray but sometimes it's somebody else who brings a lot of bad news but they bring the truth with it how do you sort that out and, and determine that on a panel that's a great question you have to have people's incentives aligned in such a way the, the one thing that i i know that Shaq did really well and i i just keep bringing this up because i learned it from him uh, the one thing that Shaq was doing really well was everybody had their incentives to invested in him, but he would make sure that everybody opined on something. So like if your lawyer really wants you to do something, 
you might go, why is he so invested in this? Not that you don't trust him, but he might go, yeah, this is going to create a lot of billables and it seems cool. And it doesn't hurt Shaq's brand. But then the manager might say, yeah, but there's another opportunity that's a lot less work. But maybe the lawyer's not as interested in that for some reason. And maybe his mom says, I hate this because I had a bad experience with that company and I hate them and you should never speak for them because they're terrible people. So they have their incentives for themselves, their agenda, I should say, is always going to be there. And so if you have a conflicting agenda, then you can figure out why that's happening. So if your accountant hates it, maybe it's because it doesn't make you a lot of money. But if you're really excited about it and your mom says that it's cool and your coach says that it's cool and your manager says that it's cool, maybe you'll do it, even though it's not the highest leverage moneymaker for you at the time, you might still do it. So you have to know why people in the panel are saying what they're saying. You can't just get a tally vote via text message and say, okay, everybody's on board. You have to ask people why they're voting yes and voting no. And you still have to assign weight to yeah, those responses right. based because on those. It's not that everybody's got a hidden agenda. Right. Oh, my attorney only wants to do this so he can bill hours. He might not even realize that. Yeah. He might just be a big fan of whatever you're, oh yeah, you're going to do a racing thing. I love NASCAR. You should totally do this. But that might be a subconscious process. So your accountant might say, I really like this idea. It's going to pay a lot. It's going to be really easy. It's going to be low drama. Let's do it. But what he's not saying because he doesn't even realize it is, yeah, this is in my town. It's my favorite sport. This is going to be really great for me. That might be subconscious. So you have to have competing subconscious ideas coming to the fore. You don't even have to know someone's true agenda or why they have it. Your accountant doesn't have to go, oh, okay, I admit it. I like NASCAR. So we're going to do this. I hope we get a pit pass. Yeah, I hope we get a pit pass. You don't have to have that. Right. You just have to have the people that vote yes or no and feel really strongly about it opine. And if they're saying, no, I hate this and here's why, it's you have another opportunity that's going to make you 10 times as much money or this is something I know you're going to hate over time or this is going to make you look bad in five years and I feel very strongly about that. That's the weight you have to assign to that vote. Do you think the guy still on the panel who he has to say, hey, uh, you didn't want to tell me where the genie outfit, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that guy still on the panel? <laughs> do you fire that guy or do you go, okay, I'm going to give you that one? Everybody gets a mulligan. Yeah. I'm going to cut you off because you've talked about, you had 600 interviews. You've talked about one very important one, have the panel. What other practical advice coming from that experience have you implemented? Which experience? The, the experience of all of that great input that you've gotten from all of the movers and shakers you've interviewed. One of the biggest takeaways that I'm getting now, especially with the Jordan Harbinger show, with some of the personalities that I've got on there, is that the more I research people to prep for those interviews and those shows, the more I realize that each person has built this like crazy outstanding career, but they never really went, okay, I'm going to be a nutrition expert or okay, I'm going to be a spy. Some people did that, of course, but most people stumbled into it by building a set of discrete skills and then being qualified for something else. So, that's been really interesting for me because I think a lot of people, myself included, you don't have to figure out, quote unquote, what you want to be when you grow up. And you can constantly be shifting fluidly and changing careers and changing interests and things like that. But building skills is what these successful people have done constantly. So you might learn about nutrition because your mother's going through some sort of brain problem like we had with Max, who was on the show. He learned all about dementia. He was a science writer. So he was in a unique position to learn all about nutrition and health science because his mother was going through dementia. So he had this passion project there, but he was also a science writer. And then he decided he knew so much about this that he was going to make a film about it because he used to be a documentary filmmaker and he made a documentary film about it and that did really well. So then he decided to write a book because he's also a writer. And now he's a, an author, a filmmaker, but really he was just researching this problem that was facing him and his family personally. So I worry a lot less and I would implore listeners to worry a lot less about what's my next move career-wise and focus on building a set of skills that they really enjoy because a lot of us, I think, go, oh man, I've got to go and I've got to get a master's in this and then I got to work in this field for five years and then maybe I can work on this other job and then that pits me right next to where I'm going to want to be. And it's like, no. 
In very rare cases, is that what you have to do? Really, if you're interested in languages, take some Chinese on Skype, learn some Chinese, whatever. That's what I'm doing, for example. And then, you know, maybe I do like writing things. So you don't have to become an author. Just start writing. I didn't start podcasting and go, all right, I'm, I'm going to do pro- this for 11 years. I'm going to be a professional broadcaster and I'm going to speak from the stage and then I'm going to do this, 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 and this. I just went, I like talking about this stuff. I'm just going to record some of it and put it out there. Then I got obsessed with the craft of interviewing, and that's where we are now. But I wasn't like, oh, man, I've got to take improv, and then I've got to learn how to interview, so I need to watch 60,000 Larry King interviews. And then, you know, I've got to write stuff, so I'm going to write every day. And then I've got to learn how to internet market, so I've got to take all these internet marketing classes. No, that's how you get sick as hell of everything that you're doing and just hate it. You build these discrete skills, and then the path starts to open up for you. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. We're talking to Jordan Harbinger. He is the host of the Jordan Harbinger Show. It's on Podcast One. You should check it out. My next question would have been, what would your advice be to a 21-year-old Jordan Harbinger about that? And you answered all of those questions. Mm -hmm. Really just do your thing and then attach your thing to a mission when you see one going by and really do it and do the work and do the hell out of it. When you interviewed our friend Jay, you went back and read a book that he wrote in like 1990. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's some research, man. You you asked questions in that interview that made me go, wow, this is digging way back. And yeah. he had to scratch and blow dust off of things from way back. And that is something that I enjoyed very much about that interview. When you're going through the process of prep, Pete and I, when we prep, this is what we do. We sit in the car on the way somewhere and we typically go, okay, what are we going to talk to Jordan about? And then we stop for tacos, bullshit about (laughs) the, uh, yes, we do that. And then while we're eating tacos, we talk about the things that amused us about somebody. We go, oh yeah. So did you hear the episode that, you know, and we talk about those things and then we laugh about them and go, okay, 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 okay. Uh, We're almost there. What did you want to ask him about? And then we come up with three or four lines of questioning. And then we turn on the mics and we may or may not get to any of those things. But what we found is that if we don't go through that exercise, we turn on the mics and we have no idea what's going on. Yeah, you're just winging it. I'm yeah. for sure. I have to go through that process. That's that's really like a need for me. Yeah. Like going back to like my I spy just need days. The tacos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I go back to my spy days and like I've got to have a conversation I believe in. Yeah. To be able to be convincing. And I'm sure you've talked to Robin and, and Michelle and all those other spy people. Like if I don't believe it, it's not I can't do this. So I have to like purge all this stuff out and then I go, Okay, I'm good, I'm ready. Like I yeah, I have to feel as is that I, what it is? It's a yeah. purging? It's a purging, and then it's like uh, I need to think about plans A through F so I know that, like, look, I, whatever comes out now, whether it's K or L or Z or 22.5, I, I, I can handle it. I've got enough ideas. And so that's really – and, and that's, that's the prep leading up to the thing. Like, I will have read the book or I will have listened to the interviews. I mean, we know, we know your work. I, mm-hmm. I was going to ask you about post office days and how you handle them now yeah, 600 sure. shows later. So the work is there. But you're right. There is a – release that I have to have to go I know that Jordan knows how to talk you know I don't have to worry about that you know and there is that form of all the way home I'm going to think Pete gets in my car and has a release yeah <laughs> okay so <laughs> keep a bottle of Febreze in your car <laughs> that's probably a good idea you know when you do that research and you hit a place where you go oh here's something do you make a conscious note of those things are you looking for those kernels Yeah. I mean, I write it down. Mm -hmm. I don't just read it and then go, I'm going to remember all this stuff. No problem. Yeah. I've got a Google doc and I'll read the book, make notes, throw them in the Google doc. That might happen like a week or two prior to the interview, maybe even more. And then I take, there's this highlight tool that I installed in Google docs, Google apps, whatever. And the highlight tool, I'll 
make a set of highlighters that's like, this goes in the intro, this goes at the close, this is their URL or whatever, and those are different colors. And then it's like, I want to make sure I get this. This other thing is optional. This one's a practical exercise because I always want practical exercises so that people can do stuff with the information after the show ends. And then I have like the yellow one, which means I already talked about it. So that happens a few days before the interview or even the morning of, depending on how much time I have. And I'll, the whole time, of course, I'm cutting and pasting things that were inside the Google Doc. So the book notes are there, the Google Talk or whatever the person gave TED Talk. All those notes are in there, separate sections. And then I move the things out of the sections and move them around into the flow that I think the show is going to have. And then I do the show and it never follows that right. progression, obviously, <laughs> because it's a conversation. Yes. I used to stick to the outline and people were like, I don't know, your show's just missing something. And now I'm like, okay, I go, I'm constantly scrolling up and down through the outline and now it's a real conversation. So I let the conversation dictate the order of things, but you have to put it in a flow chart first and then just give up on following it. Yeah. It's the same kind of release. It's It's the the same same kind of preparational release. I came into this with, I don't know if I said this out loud, DP, but I think my objective was to come in here and not say the words, the art of charm. Fail. Yeah. <laughs> Way to go. I, I No, I just, yeah, I, I just, <laughs> I just it. fell on my own grenade right there. <laughs> but the reason that I bring that up is because I, I think that is one of the things that I do is I set up parameters instead. It's almost like the negative of that. I go, okay, here's this and these lanes are here and here's what I'm going to not do. And when I have that, I feel like that's my security blanket. I can, I can just look over to the left and look over to the right and go, okay, I'm in the middle of the lane Yeah. and do all the things within that. Who have you had so far on the Jordan Harbinger show? It's a good question. So the first guy that I had on was my friend, Max. And I say friend because it's not like, oh, yeah, I just had a bunch of my friends on the show. He's the science writer whose mom was suffering from dementia and was like, how do I figure out what's going on here? Because my mom's way too young for this. I also had Simon Sinek, who wrote a book called Start With Why. And he's a very well-known TED speaker who basically pioneered this work that says, if people don't know why they're doing something, if people don't have a purpose at work or they don't believe in your vision, they're never going to work that hard. So people have to believe in your vision. And here's how you get them to find their own purpose and vision and get them enrolled in yours. And that was a huge... That episode did really well because, you know, it's kind of like having a super popular best-selling author just drop in and give stuff that they haven't talked about elsewhere, which is exactly what we did with that Simon Sinek episode. And then I had another guy that uh, there's tons of people I've, of course, have had on the show so far. But one that would really interest, I think, your audience is Bill Browder, and he was one of the first investors in Russia, I mean, after the fall. So he went out there in the 90s and was like, wait a minute, I can pay $20 for a stock voucher, privatization voucher that they gave to an employee. He doesn't want it because he doesn't care about owning the company. He just wants 20 bucks because it's like a month's pay or something, you know, for a week's pay for these guys. And he goes, so if I get $2 million together, I can buy all the outstanding shares of some Polish bus company. But the bus company... For, I can buy for two million dollars, or own a majority stake in this nickel mine. Yeah, or yeah, some crazy. exactly. <laughs> and he's like, "So wait a minute, how much money did this nickel mine make last year? Oh, 180 million dollars. Okay, how do I buy the whole thing? Well, you get 75 million dollars and you buy all the shares. Wait a minute, I can buy a 180 million dollar company for 70, 75 million dollars. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Here's, Here's 75 million dollars. Yeah, uh-huh. Now I have the company, and he's like, great. And then they were like, here's your company that you own. And he went, wait a minute. So then he went back to New York and was like, guys, give me all the money. <laughs> give me uh, all of the money. We can buy all of the companies. So then he went over to Russia and Poland and Slovakia, and he was just buying up bus companies, nickel mines, telecom, and they were killing it. And then he went and got screwed over by some of his banks or they had problems. So he went, I'm just going to get my own investors. So he built a hedge fund. And then he was finding that these oligarchs were saying, oh, well, we're going to dilute your share value because I want your company. And he went, well, to hell with that. So he went to the media and the media went, hey, this gangster is screwing with our foreign investment, which is bringing in all this money to our country. We're not going to stand for that. So he started taking down these oligarchs. Wow. And having them arrested. And they, then he uncovered, this, he uncovered this massive tax fraud and... He found out Vladimir Putin was actually helping him take down these oligarchs. 
that he was having them investigated and having them thrown in jail and all this stuff. But then he uncovered this massive tax fraud that was like $230 million that his company had paid. And he went, wait a minute, let's investigate this tax fraud. And then his lawyer got thrown in jail and tortured to death. And they found out the tax fraud was basically like a top down kind of thing. And then Vladimir Putin was suddenly like, oh, actually, you're a criminal now. So we're going to try to arrest you. And he was like, nah, I'm going back to London. And then they put out an Interpol red notice for him, which means he could go to Canada from the United States and get arrested and extradited to Russia. So he fought that, damaged Russia's international standing because Interpol doesn't fight red notices. They just execute. But it turned out to be politically motivated. He proved it. Then he created the Magnitsky Act, which is responsible for sanctions against Vladimir Putin and all of his cronies in Russia. And that got passed in the U.S. Senate. And now he's trying to go do it in Europe. So he's like public enemy number one for Vladimir Putin. But Putin kind of is having a hard time getting to this guy because he's so in the public eye and he's really damaging Russia and especially criminals in Russia international standing. So now he's passing sanctions against Russia or trying to get sanctions passed against Russia and doing all this financial investigation and trying to avenge his lawyer. So that that was Bill Browder. And we got that whole story out of him on the show, which wow. is pretty cool. Yeah, that's epic. Yeah, that's a, yeah. That, that is an epic story. Big brass ones, that Bill Browder. I mean... People who screw with Vladimir Putin get Dead. murdered with like radiation. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and he's yeah. like, no, I don't care. Yeah. You know, wow. try, come come at me, bro. <laughs> come at me, bro. <laughs> Bring your rice and I'd then like your needle. I'd like to get back to Simon Sinek for a second because I think that we're all born with start with why. I mean, little kids Maybe. constantly yeah. drive us bananas with why, why, why. Yeah. They are the ones who have it down. They're the ones who are curious enough about the world and about how things work to not get suckered into a long career in the factory in Allentown where at the end of your life, you've sure put in a lot of reps at hammering out widgets, but yeah. there was no fulfillment. Yeah, we beat the why out of people. And then 20 years into their career, we're like, what's the problem? You're in middle management, man. Everything's going really good for you. And yeah. It's like, I hated every minute of this. Why there was here? a commercial. It was like, what's your goal in life? It was all these little kids. And they got to say like adult things. So it was like, what's your goal in life? I want to claw my way to middle management. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it was like, yeah, Jesus Christ, who wants that? But then, like, there's so many of us that do that. You know, mm-hmm. you're like, oh, I just, I just can't screw this up. I can't afford to get fired. And so disengagement just shoots through the roof, you know? Yeah, of course. Not only that, but, I mean, it's funny. I even had to look at my phone when you asked, who came on the, Ar- the Jordan Harbinger show so far? I was like, What's been released? (laughs) Uh, And the reason is because I've been so busy doing shows. And that was kind of an eye opener for me is because what am I going to do? I have to start over. And I was like, start recording stuff. Start doing what you do best. So in that way, I've sort of found my why, right? Not just what I like doing, but the reason is because it helps other people so much to get those stories, get those practicals, get that information out in that way that's entertaining enough for people to digest it. But... Before this, I was an attorney and I went to college for a long time. And it's just like, I went all the way up the forget about why you do anything kind of ladder. Just (laughs) just grind it out and do what you got to do. And then I was like, wait, I got to the top and I went, this blows. And then I was like, what do I do now? And I was like, I'll stick with this for four years. Right. But then the economy hit a dive and I went, oh, crap, I don't really, this sucks now. I'm going to get fired. So then I had this opportunity by getting laid off or voluntarily laying myself off, I guess I would say, to dive into doing the show. So sometimes you find your why because of an accident like that or because of circumstances, but... Your why finds you. Your why can also find you, but if that happens, it can be problematic because then it's like, that's what you hear when people go, yeah, you know, I got into this particular field because like Max Lugavere from the show, his mom got dementia early. It's like, well, I don't think he went, I'm so glad that happened because I found this passion for nutrition and research. I don't think he would say that. And most people wouldn't say, oh yeah, I got really interested in heart health because my entire family died of heart complications by age 50. Like nobody's thinking like that, but sometimes your why finds you. So it's actually nice to maybe go ahead and do some exploration on your own to find your why a la Simon Sinek. Because otherwise, you could run face first into the why in a way that's just really uncomfortable for you. 
on your show previously, you talk about your post office days. I mentioned it earlier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's those days when you're just like, yeah, this is too much. I can't handle this anymore. Why don't I just wear some shorts and deliver some mail? What do you do with those days now? Because remember, you still have them. It doesn't matter how great you've got it. Whatever it is that that person does, they're just like, this is like, why didn't I just go work for the city for 25 years and have a retirement? You know, all lined yeah. up. Yeah, 25 years of avoidance behavior. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, when you're doing what we do, when you're like, I just got to go grab these shows, you know, yeah. sometimes it is it is tough. And you're like, you're, you're so enriched in other ways, it sometimes it's tough to realize just how wealthy you are, yeah. you know. But what do you do with those days now? I don't have post office days anymore. And it's funny because I thought I was going to have them again. Having started over with the Jordan Harbinger show, I thought, oh, man, I'm going to have these post office days. It it's actually did not happen. So to explain the post office days, for the beginning of my other business with the other show, I really, for years, I would wake up and go, oh, my God, I just this day is terrible. I should just become a construction worker. Those guys are going to go home at four. They know where they're going to be. And a lot of friends of mine were like, what's wrong with you? But now... I got past that phase and business was fun and I, I had an idea of what I was doing and I enjoyed the work. Then when everything kind of started over with the Jordan Harbinger show, I was like, oh man, I'm going to have these again. And I haven't because I already know what I want to do. I already know why I like doing what I'm going to do. Uh, yes, I have to grind it out again. Like I'm 27 instead of 37, but I'm not worried about that because I know that I built it once I can build it again. The reason I was having the post office days is because I was thinking, is this ever going to pop off? Mm. And you have no guarantee. Right. But now I know what I'm capable of, and I have more relationships than I did before, and I know what I'm doing. So now I'm just thinking, well, yeah, it's going to happen. It, it's just a matter of time and executing on a strategy. But w if you have your post office days, usually it's because you have no idea if you're ever going to, if you're doing the right thing. You don't have the why, you don't have a path laid out, you don't have a plan. You're just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. And that's what I see in the business that I left is just the team, what's left of it, just winging it. And I'm just thinking, wow. Good. That's what it was. You're going to have some post office days pretty soon. Yeah. And I see that with companies too, where they're just like, yeah, we're spending $20 million on user acquisition. And I'm thinking, okay, good luck. Yeah. Hmm. Because if that's your strategy, you throw money at the problem and it's not working, I really hope you crack the code. Because if you don't, you're going to be out $20 million and you're going to go, we have this shiny app that nobody cares about, right? So it can become a real problem. That's what leads to post office days, not having a plan, not knowing how to execute on the plan or not knowing if the plan is going to succeed. So that's the problem is often you don't know if your plan is going to succeed. So you have to have some sort of like delusional confidence in your abilities. Then you'll avoid the post office days. But once you start really getting ground down by your own grind and not knowing what you're doing and just trying to do everything at once, that's when you wake up and go, screw this. And if you have enough bad days, you will eventually quit. Unless you're really hardwired to be an entrepreneur. I think a lot of people aren't. Let's spin that around because there's a lesson in there that's more positive than just the point out of what's terrible and how to identify when you're stuck in the middle of yeah. terrible. And that is to say that you start off with understand why you're doing it. Figure out what it is that you love about whatever it is you're doing and understand the why. And then what's the next step? You have to have a strategy that you execute. Because I think a lot of people go, I love... Let me think of an example here. Baking. I love baking. I should start a bakery. Wait, should you? Yeah. Or do you just like baking? Because I was talking about this on my show earlier today. There's no faster way to ruin a hobby than to turn it into your job. So do you love baking or do you want to run a bakery? Right? Those are two totally different things. And I think a lot of people don't get that. And I, I think the reason is because, especially now, there's this pressure to make all of the th you It's like, oh, if you don't live your purpose, you fail. Oh, if you're not living your dream, if you don't follow your dreams, you fail. So you have these people that work in like a real estate office and they go, I don't know. I just work in a real estate office, but I feel like I'm missing out on something. And it's like, yeah, you feel like you are because you're looking at Instagram and everybody's like, oh, I'm doing my dream. I wrote a book and I'm a consultant and I'm speaking on stage. And it's like, well... Is that really what you want to do or is this right. person selling you an ebook about how to speak on stage, right? So it's all <laughs> built on FOMO and a lot of people go, oh, well, I just not, is this my purpose? Is this all there is? And it's like, well, maybe, but maybe not. 
but also you can also work in the real estate office and you can, as a hobby, bake things. Yeah. You could have a side hustle where you bake things. You don't have to quit your job as a real estate agent, open up a bakery, take out a loan from a bank, mortgage your house. Like You don't have to do that. But there's this men- mentality of all in. And I don't think it's healthy. And especially with entrepreneurs in business, I think people go, I have to be all in or I'll never know if I can make it. And it's like, well, do you have to make it? If you're miserable being a real estate agent, I get it. But if you are going to be miserable doing something else, then just stay where you are with the real estate thing and come up with other things that give you purpose, volunteering, hobbies, etc. You don't have to have a job that revolves around everything you love. That's unrealistic for most people. It's fortunate when you get there. But I'll tell you, as somebody who does what they love for a living, it still ends up being a job most days. Yeah. So... You're not not working. I mean, there, there's right. a lot going on. We've had a couple people on who get to the dream, but it was never the dream that they imagined. It, it is the same dream, but it's like, oh, these other twists and turns and I end up. So I'm thinking about we've known on, on the show and in our lives, a couple people that work for like a, a mystere or Cirque du Soleil shows and they play music. They're professional musicians mm-hmm. with benefits, a steady gig, a schedule. They can go see their kids at plays and stuff. That's not a rock and roll star, but it kind of still is. You know, mm-hmm, you're still mm-hmm. getting played to play all these great tunes. You would never pick that at 18 and go, I want to have a corporate gig where I make a whole, you know, like you want something else. But as you put the work in, you end up at a different place that actually is what you want because it's really hard to have a rock and roll lifestyle for 40 years. Yeah. It's really, really tough. Just ask Keith Richards. Right, yeah, ask Keith Richards. When you look at all the different types of people that you see, is there like a, I know there's a lot of similarities, but is there a group of people you realize like, these people get it? Like, is it is it the lawyers? Is it the spies? Is it the Ivy League grads? Like, can you bundle what a good population is from the, because you've had all kinds of people. I've met a lot of people that have a really good work ethic, and a lot of them do okay in business or in their career because they are able to outwork everyone. But I've never really met anybody who's just so smart that they're doing well without a work ethic, just to throw that out there. Because I think a lot of people think talent is going to do it. It never really does. And there's some quote that's like, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard or something like that, right? Yeah. But questioning everything is really, really interesting for me because the people who really are successful do this because they think about how do I get around this? Or how do I make this more efficient? Or do I really have to go A, B, C, D, E, F, G? Or can I just go A, D, F, G? And that was something that I mirrored in my life by accident that I discovered also by interviewing all these other people. So for example, when I was in school, I was like, oh, I can coast through school, yay, which is not a good strategy. And I mean elementary school and high school, not college. And then I got to college and everybody was really smart. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now what? Yeah. And everyone's like, let's get wasted. And I was like, wait a minute. If I don't drink my face off every day, I can just do the homework and I'll end up in the top half of the class. And then I got to Wall Street and it was like, if you work hard, great. So is everybody else. If you're smart, great. So is everybody else. And I was like, oh crap, my competitive advantage is gone. So I looked for a different competitive advantage and that was oh, if I make all these great relationships, I can bring business to the firm. And if I work on this skill set, all these people who are trying to outwork everyone else or just be smarter, they're going to figure out in three to five years that they need to cultivate relationships. But by that point, I will have spent five years doing this. I'll have a process. I'll have relationships preliminarily already down. So that will be my new competitive advantage. And so questioning everything always gave me a new competitive advantage, whereas a lot of people who are successful do this, they don't really realize it. But a lot of people who are really smart and work hard, they end up plateauing at a certain point because they're not questioning how they can get a competitive advantage on other folks. Or they're thinking that they have to compete against other people instead of leveraging relationships to compete alongside other people to solve problems. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You've just started the Jordan Harbinger show. You're seven episodes deep Mm -hmm. as we record this. And as tough as it is to start all over again, it's a rebirth. And now that you have the opportunity at a rebirth, what are you going to do different? So what I'm doing differently now that I don't have to sort of 
shill dating programs or whatever for the Art of Charm. <laughs> and also, I, I don't have to manage egos. Like during that other business, I just spent a lot of time managing Boy. egos. And it was really tough. It, initially, it was fine because I was working with my friends and it was cool. And then after 11 years of growth, people grow at different rates. And that's fine. But if you're freaking married to those, those people in a business setting or in an actual marriage setting, you're, it's going to be a problem. Luckily, in a marriage, if you're really tight, you're, you grow alongside with your spouse. At least that's what I've been told, right? Because uh, I've been married for like not even a year. But if you're in a business, you really have to be not just in business with people that bring value to your business, but with people with similar growth rates. And that was not the case for me. So I would spend 20 hours preparing an interview. I'd take lessons from a broadcast journalist. I'd travel and do a speaking class that's three weeks long, 20 days, working on speaking and all this stuff. And then I'd get a speaking gig and somebody in the business would complain that they didn't get it. And then I, you know, we'd have to deal with temper tantrums and je- ego stuff, jealousy. And it was just like, why is this a question? I put in the work and bring the business back to the whole. And then it would be like, well, I'm not going to let you do this initiative that would be good for the business because it makes me feel bad about myself. And I was just like, okay, I've got to get out of here. So now I don't have that problem. I don't have these strings attached. I don't feel like anything's holding me back circumstances are less than ideal because obviously I didn't plan on starting from scratch, but I bring with me all the relationships. I bring with me the talented members of the team having gotten the lucky draw with everybody sort of following me out of the company and into the new show. And that's been really useful because now I realize I didn't think before that I had the weight that I was carrying, but Everybody else on the external side sort of reminded me like, hey, you don't have to deal with this anymore. You don't have to deal with that anymore. You don't have to deal with this anymore. And I thought, oh, yeah, because all of the crust, this plaque on your psyche builds up over time. And you don't realize it until you kind of go to the cleaners and get it scraped off, right? It's like a breakup with somebody where you go, oh, I'm going to miss Angela so much. And then people are like, yeah, but didn't she like spend all your money? Well, yeah, there was that. Didn't she cry every Friday when she got too drunk and you had to bring her home and that was embarrassing? Oh, yeah, well, there was that. And you kind of go, what the hell was I doing with Angela for 10 years? What the hell was I thinking? And your friends are like, hello, we were trying we to told tell you. you. <laughs> right? But you didn't listen because you're, you're sitting there thinking, You know, if we move to San Diego where she wants to go, everything's going to be better. Then I can live in San Diego and not get my dick sucked. Right, yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. And and it's just like, everything will be better when we have more money in the business. Oh, wait, we have money now. Everyone's just a bigger asshole. Right. You know? And it's like, oh, well, if we all invest in this for all of ourselves, then they won't have anything to complain about. Oh, wait, no, they're really creative. They found something else to complain about, right? And you realize, (laughs) oh, wait a minute. We're not dealing with, like, rational actors here. No. And so being in the old business and the old show was a really good place for me to cut my teeth and develop a skill set. But now I realize there's just the value of being stuck in there was – minuscule compared to what we're able to do now. And people go, what's going to change? And the answer is, I'm not entirely sure because I'm still discovering, oh yeah, I can do this without suffering three months of passive aggressive email drama for the next quarter. And so that's been hugely freeing for me and especially for my team because I work with my wife, I work with some close friends, and they're really excited about this. I'm the only one who seems to be nervous about <laughs> restarting. The one who's nervous. <laughs> Everybody else is like, this is amazing, this is great, we're finally free, and I'm like, but 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 we have all those things we gotta rebuild. And at first I was just like, I'm the only one who sees the whole picture, that's why I'm nervous. And they're like, no, we get it. You're just nervous because you have sunk costs and you've, you're like nostalgic for the old days. But truthfully, This is going to be one of those blips on my radar where every entrepreneur that I've spoken to has been through some shit, has said this before. This is going to be the time you look back and you say, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I'm like, "Uh, I don't believe you. Yeah. Because right now it kind of sucks, right? But every day it sucks less and there's much more exciting stuff going on than I ever thought. More upside every single day. More upside every day, happening faster than I ever thought it would. And that's been huge for me because I haven't had to worry about my team's motivation, they're more worried about me getting my head in the game. And that's been great. So what's going to change? We're going to be able to open up the format a little bit. We're going to be able to do different types of shows that still have the same level of quality, but aren't shoehorning 
in some topic I'm interested in into the topics that are quote unquote required to be on the show because now it's my show. I can talk about politics if I want to. I tend not to, but I can. I can talk with an enemy of Vladimir Putin, or I can talk with somebody who figured out yeah. nutrition's relationship with dementia, or vice versa. I can do those things. I don't have to go. Ugh, let's do another show about breakups. Let's do another show about body language. I can do a good show with that, with an expert, and not go, oh, so-and-so is going to get mad if I don't include them on this. Like, I don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. And that is hugely freeing. And I've been in the other mess for so long that don't know. Everyone goes, you must have so many ideas about what you're going to do. And it's almost like, it's almost like getting out of jail. Mm. I've never been in jail for a long period of time, but I would, or maybe out of the military. Maybe that's a better example. You get out and people go, what are you going to do now? And you go, oh, shit, I don't really know. I don't know. I've been spending a lot of time not thinking about that, working on something else, and I'm not entirely sure. I've got to sort of rebuild my identity or I've got to build another skill set. It's a little scary at first, but it's also exciting. Whereas when you're in the service or when you're in that cell or whatever, you know, you're in that other career, you don't spend a lot of time, at least I didn't spend a lot of time daydreaming about what was next. I was just thinking, how do I make this situation better? I never thought about removing all of the constraints. Yeah, that's like, I think about men's workout magazines and how you want to be a writer, here you are working, and it's like every six weeks, we're going to talk about bigger buys. Yeah. And then two weeks later, with bigger thighs. Six-pack abs. Right, widening your back. And it's like, oh, God damn, we just write about this shit over and over and over again. And that's not good for your audience. Your no. audience is going to be like, yo... I already got a big back. I already yeah. followed your advice. I'm out the door on yeah. something else. Like you've ever read a men's fitness magazine. <laughs> I look at it for the pictures. Yeah. Yeah. He just likes looking at dude six packs. Uh-huh. But you're right. Here was one big problem I had with the old show that I don't have with the Jordan Harbinger show. My audience was going, hey, I loved your show. Like somebody would add me on Facebook or I'd meet someone at a conference and they'd go, I loved your show. I listened for like five years and I go, what the hell, man? Yeah. It's better now. And they'd go, oh yeah, but you know, I got married. So, and I'd go, oh, wait a minute. All the smart people followed our advice <laughs> and some of them stuck with us uh-huh. and the rest of them went, I've outgrown these guys. Yeah. But I'm growing too. I'm just not allowed to talk about half the subjects because- that's the money maker the for the other. Yeah, the money maker for the other company. Yeah, the business partners are going. Hey, you got to talk more about six pack abs, or we're not going to get people buying the fitness issue. And I'm just thinking, cool. Um, let me ram my head through this brick wall first, and then I'll be right with you. Whereas now I can, gr- my audience can grow with me, and I can grow with my audience. Whereas before it was like, no, 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 circle around, orbit these topics, or we're not going to attract the right customers for our products. And that just made me want to barf. I'm going to say one more thing that I'm going to be good because we, you've done an awesome job and thank you so much for sitting with us. But one of the things we've learned from talking to a lot of musicians is that if you don't evolve with your audience, at some point, your audience doesn't believe that you're with them anymore because yeah. you're not them. You know, like right now you're a millennial, whatever four generations down the line is like, they're going to be like, who's that old fucker? You know, yeah. like they're not going to want you around. You have to grow and you yeah. know your audience because your audience is, is you. Yes, you know? exactly. It's such a powerful thing. So good for you for making that decision. I it, love it. It's tough. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, not just people who host shows, have to think about this. Because if you are a matchmaker and then you get married and then you have a couple of kids, are you really still a good matchmaker? You have no idea how dating apps are working like right. or dating coach or whatever. You have no clue how any of that yeah. stuff works. And that's why you end up with these parenting experts, for example, and they're like 80. And you go... Your grandkids just got out of college. You don't know anything about parenting right Right. now. Yeah. Yeah. Because you'll see those questions too. Nowadays, you have to parent with social media and you have gadgets around your house. And when you were 20, 60 years ago and just got your mind wrapped around, oh man, I might be a parent soon. You know, that was a, that was many generations. I saw maybe a two to three year old girl today with a screen in her hand at the airport. You know, like and, and that, she could do it better than we could. Oh, for sure. But and then why does she have it? Like my my 
old man brain went, I wish you should have a ball. You know? Yeah. yeah. Or, or like, oh, you, uh, let me tell you, you need to limit your child's screen time. And yeah. then they're like, oh, really? Screw you. This is the only thing that keeps her from throwing food across the restaurant. So right. maybe you should limit your screen time, bitch. Yeah. Not you know? only is she yeah. not throwing food, she knows her times tables through seven. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. what's more cliche than a kid acting out at an airport? Like, here's a kid not acting out at an airport. Yeah. So you're right. Your 80-year-old parenting expert, it's hard to swallow. You yeah. Know? They're like, oh, send your kids outside to play. Well, they don't want to go. And when they were outside, they were getting exercise. That's great. Yep. But guess what? My kid speaks Chinese, so go fly a kite. <laughs> right. And you outside know? where I live might be a hypodermic needle. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. no peers for that child. Uh, here's what I want to say. In the, in the time that we've spent in this conversation, I have been self-reflective more times than I imagined I would be. And practically every other sentence you spoke, I thought, oh, holy shit, that's me. Or, oh, holy shit, I've done exactly that. Mm. And one of the things that you brought with you along with the things that you have to rebuild is you brought an audience. And and I know that Pete and I are proud to say we're in. We're with nice. you. Yeah, we're I appreciate going. that. Let's go on the ride. Everybody, the Jordan Harbinger Show, check it out course you can get it on itunes and stitcher and all those places but podcast one is his home base and uh thank you man i can't thank you enough thank you guys yeah for coming out